recording. All right, because I have a pretty good feeling that today's lecture really needs to be recorded. So that's why I need to make sure that it, everything is going. All right, so what we'll do today is to, we already talked about RAM in this class, I believe, okay? So what we'll do today is actually to take a look at the processor and um, we'll go through some analysis of the processor, basically how it works. All right, so let me go ahead and get logic sim started. All right, so here's logic sim, and I'm going to load the processor. And the way to get to the processor, you can um, let me send you guys you know, by announcement a you know, a zip file because for those of you. I don't recommend you know doing this you know, alongside, but if you want to do that, you know, that's okay with me. Um, let's see where is that right here. All right. All right. So I am going to send you a zip file you know, through the announcement, and I may. Actually, have to re-download everything too. So processor files patch because I think I may not have uh, kept the zip file. Let me see if I still have it. Oh, am I still have it? Maybe. Nope, don't have it anymore. Recent files. Oh, I still have it. Okay, cool. So I'm sending you a zip file. You know that has three files in it. The first file inside the zip file is called alu.cert. The second one is processor.cert, and then the last one is regbank.cert. Uh, so you have to open up the processor 0004.cert file, and then help Logic Sim to find the other two files if you want to follow follow along. I do not um, think you need to follow along. You know, kind of just kind of focus on what I talk about. Um, it's recorded. It's being recorded right now, so that means you know everything here is recorded. I will also do something that I normally do not do. I'm gonna take notes on the side, so that means you know I'm going to share with you my notes, and I recommend that you do your note taking as well. So at the end of the class, we can compare my notes with your notes. Okay, because you know, then you can see. You know, whether you have the same information in your notes. Um, that can be an interesting experiment. So let me switch back to Logic CM to go find the screen. Um, did I skip over that one already? Yep, I did. Did I put it? Right there. Okay. So this is uh this is the processor you know where you will be doing most of your programming you know, for the for the rest of the semester. Um, it is fake. It is complicated, but it really is not difficult to understand if you know how to understand. So part of what today's lecture is about is how do you understand this processor and how do you track what it is doing and what it is about to do. So that's why today's lecture is actually very important because you know, um, over the next two weeks or so, we'll be you know, looking into the details of the processor a lot in order to understand what each opcode or operation code is actually doing in the processor. Um, so that's why you know, note taking is important because you, know, you might need to go back to the notes a few times, at least at the beginning, in order to kind of understand how to analyze you know, the processor. So I'm open, opening up um, Joplin just so that I can capture my own notes in Joplin and I will put this away you know, as soon as I set up you know, everything. So this way you, know, you don't have to look at this entire thing, but instead you can focus on you know, what I talk about and then you can take your own notes you know, as you are you know, you know, listening to me. 
So today, today is 2024. Oh, so this is 10, 10 already. 10, 9. Is it 10, 9 or 10, 8? 10, 9. So <clears throat> I'll put this on the side. So I'll be doing my own you know, notes taking on the side. So there are a few things in the processor that are particularly important. I will point those out as we go along. Okay. So what we'll do is we are going to execute instructions on this processor. We haven't even started to talk about programming or opcode or anything like that, but that's okay because the RAM, which is this component here, always has instructions to execute. In other words, right now we have an opcode of 00, 0 to execute, and we'll just kind of go with that. Okay. So the whole point of the von Neumann architecture is the instructions of what the computer is supposed to do or how it is supposed to perform its operations is stored in memory as opposed to hardwired, which is actually wires interconnecting between the components. So in this case, okay, the instructions are stored in the RAM component. So every time here, or I should say the sum of the bytes in RAM, the sum of the memory locations in RAM, is storing the instructions. So then the rest of the processor basically goes like, oh, okay, you want me to add this number to this number and then store the sum back into here. Okay, so some of the instructions could do that. The starting point, okay, so you might want to start writing down in your notes in your own words. In order to start the analysis of the entire processor, which looks really busy and really complicated, everything starts here with what I call the microcode pointer. Okay, so this is called a microcode pointer, even though it doesn't seem to say microcode at all. That's because U is the approximation of the Greek letter mu, you know, and mu is the uh, unit of micro. So microcode means it is a subcode. So for each opcode that is in RAM, it corresponds to one or more microcode that is stored in the ROM. So everything starts with the microcode pointer because that basically points to a particular address of a particular location in the ROM and the content of that ROM at that location goes to every place else in the processor. So I'm going to write some notes here on the side. Okay, so we'll say start with the microcode pointer. Okay because this determines the address of the ROM location that contains the individual bits to control the rest of the processor. I will share my notes with you, okay? But I'm just you know, writing it out. All right, so we'll take a quick look at, so we'll start with this, okay, I'm, I take it back. I'll just start with this, and then we try to analyze you know, what the output of this register is going. So this is the node connected to the output of the microcode pointer. And you can see that it doesn't go to just too many places. It goes to the ROM. It goes to specifically the A port of the ROM. So somebody remind me what is the, the job or what is the role or what is the function of the A port of ROM. A stands for Address, very good, okay. So, and whatever bit pattern we present here, assuming the ROM is on, this one is always on because I have a constant of one connected to the select, which is the enable of ROM. So assuming the ROM is enabled, what is the content of the A port doing? You know, what is the job of the A port? It only has three ports, right? Okay. So what is the job of the A port or the address port? And what is the input to? To specify the address, okay, very good. Because a ROM has many locations. In this case, this particular ROM has 4,096 locations. And the, way, the reason why I know is because the address bit width is 12. With 12 bits, I can address from zero to location 4,095 in decibel. 
That's why there are 4,096 locations in the ROM. When it is enabled, okay, when the ROM is enabled, whatever location you specify using the A port, the content of that location is going to be presented to the D port. That is how a ROM operates. We talked about this last Wednesday or Monday, actually. We talked about this on Monday or last Wednesday. Um, so it's kind of important to make sure that we you know, kind of review all the material because you know, I'm kind of making the assumption that we know how the components of the processor operates. All right. So because the micro code pointer is 0, 0, 0, so that means we are addressing location 0, 0, 0, and this is the content, 1080007 is the content of location 0 of the ROM. And that is now being presented to the D port. So if you look at the D port, okay, if I use a poking tool to refer to the D port, I see the same thing, right? You, know, you, you can see how the D port is allocated to 1080007, which is the content of the location that is currently being addressed in the ROM. Do we have any questions about that? Okay. So now the next question is, where are these bits going? There are a lot of bits going everywhere. Because if you look at the ROM, so let me go back to look at the ROM. Each location has 26 bits. So those 26 zeros and ones are going everywhere in the processor. So basically what you need to do now is to look at the output of the ROM and then you ask, where is this going? Well, some of these are pretty easy, like you know, bit uh, zero. So you can, you can track down bit zero of the output of the ROM and it just goes to this location and then it goes to here and then eventually it is presented it presented itself as op fetch after an and operation. So that one is pretty easy. But some of these is a little bit harder. So this is going to RAM cell. This is going to RAM load. These are called tunnels. So when you see a symbol like this, which is kind of like a rectangle, but except you know one end has a has a little wedge on it, it's little angle. So these are called tunnels. A tunnel is basically a way so that we don't have to draw wires everywhere in the entire your know, circuit because everything that shares the same name, all the tunnels sharing the same name, they are all logically connected. So what does that mean? Well, what that means is if I go back up here and if I use the poking tool to select a wire connected to RAM cell, RAM select, you can see how this one is also highlighted. That's because RAM cell here as a tunnel and RAM cell here as a tunnel, they're spelled exactly the same. So that means they are logically referring to the same electrical node. So are we okay? Are we understanding the, you know, what a tunnel is and why it is helpful when you have a complicated circuit? Because without uh, the use of tunnels, I'll be using the wires and go everywhere. It, be it becomes really difficult to track which wire is going, going where, okay? And then the naming of the tunnel can be helpful too because RAM cell is connected to, guess what? The cell port of the RAM component. Is that okay? All right. So that's an easy one. It is a one single bit you know, kind of tunnel. And then we look at something that is not so easy, this one here. So microcode data, okay, which is the name of the tunnel, is used over here. I could have just you know, you know, drawn the wire all the way here and make that connection. But you can also see how microcode data is using a splitter to split into what? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 9, 10, 11, 12, it is split into 12 tunnels. And then these 12 tunnels are referenced you know, all the way throughout the rest of the processor. Like PC Muxmux is one of the tunnels you know, from here, okay? It is you know, basically bit 17 to 19 of microcode data. And the microcode data by itself is referencing uh, bit three to bit 23 of the output of the ROM. So basically, you know, in short, 
we are looking at the output of the D port and we're splitting that into a bazillion tunnels and each one is going to one component of the processor to do a particular thing. Are we doing okay so far? Now tracking these things can be cumbersome, okay? So I'm going to teach you guys a technique of analyzing the processor, but without having to kind of go through all the tunnels and track down with everything, not at least at the same time. All right. So let's see what we are going to, how we're going to figure out what the processor is about to do at this point. There are only about nine components in the entire processor that can actually do something of the importance, or at least this, we can start with analyzing those nine components. So I'm going to point out what, what those nine components are. So we'll start from, so I'm going to read the processor, you know, from upper left corner to, you know, we'll just kind of scan it, okay? So the first one is called the register bank. Inside the register bank, if you right click on the register bank and click view reg bank, you will see the inside of the register bank. There are four registers here. Okay, so we have register A, B, C, and D. Okay, so in my notes here, I'm going to write down, okay, components to track. Would include register A to D inside the register bank. Okay. But when you look at the register banks, you can see how register A, B, C, and D, if they're not enabled, we're not going to be, we don't think it is important at least to start analyzing with. So how can register A be enabled? So I want you guys to answer the questions. How can register A be enabled? Well, what do you do? The first thing you do is you analyze, okay, you figure out which pin is the enable button or the enable port. You track it down, okay, using the token tool. You track it down, it is the output of something that we haven't seen. It's like, heck, you forgot to talk about what a decoder is. I did, and that was intentional. Because a decoder is basically the same as a demultiplexer with, a in, with an input that is a constant one. Now you have to remember what is a D multiplexer. Do you remember what is a, what a D multiplexer is? Okay, I see some nods. So for people who do not remember what a D multiplexer is, that means, well, it's time to review, okay? Because after we introduce a component, I am assuming that you remember what a D multiplexer is. So a D multiplexer has one input and multiple outputs. The job of a demultiplexer is to connect the only input to up to one of the outputs. It is a selector, okay? You select which output to connect to the input. So in this case, you can kind of imagine the input is a constant of one. So normally the decoder, this one, has an enable pin also. Now it is disabled. If it is disabled, all the outputs are zeros. So that means, you know, if the select or the enable of the decoder is a zero, we don't have to worry about any one of the registers A, B, C, or D getting updated. Getting, main to the, getting back to the main circuit, that means, you know, this particular pin or in enable, as long as this is dark green or zero, we know nothing that inside the, nothing inside the register bank is going to update. All right, so that's one. Um, and then we just go you know, across. This is another component that can potentially be enabled. It is called the flags register. So I'm going back to my notes here and just write it down. You know, the next one is called the flags register. And then going across again, okay. So go across, do, 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 like so. We see the RAM component. The RAM component can also update, okay? Because that's the main difference between RAM and ROM. ROM is read only. RAM is read write capable. It can also update. So now we write down the um, that component also in my notes here. So the RAM component is something that we also have to keep in mind because it can potentially update. 
So scrolling down a little bit and then scroll back all the way to the left hand side, we have PC, which is the program counter. So I write down on in my notes, <clears throat> PC, okay, which stands for program counter, is a register. Basically, I'm just looking at the registers and RAM and make a note of you know, where they are and kind of track their names too. And then scrolling a little bit here, we have another register. It is called the instruction register. So I'm going to write it down too. So now I wrote down, I'm just writing down instruction register. There we go. So those are the things that you start with your analysis. Every time you want to know uh, what is the process of doing right now or what is it about to do, those are the components that you need to track. So, okay, these are the ones that we need to analyze. So we have, you know, if you count register A to D as one single thing, because with one analysis, we can kind of know whether something is going to change inside the register bank. So how many have you, are you counting in your notes? How many things do we need to track? Five, that is correct. So the question is, can you track five things? Just sequentially look at all those five things and find out which one is of importance. Okay, I don't see any answer. I'm going to assume your answer is yes, okay, because five is not that many. So the next thing is, if you want to make this, if you want to speed up the process, what I do, what I recommend is print out the circuit. So go to file, you can either export it and then you can digitally you know, edit the uh, PNG file and do whatever you want to do. You can also print it out you know, on the printer, then you can use a highlighter to highlight the five things that we just talked about. Because if you don't, it might take you a while to kind of figure out you know, where each one is located, but if you just kind of print it out on a piece of paper and use a highlighter, the only five things that you're highlighting, okay, is not that difficult, okay? So you highlight those five things, and then every time we try to analyze the processor, you start with those five things. Do we have any questions at this point? Okay. So one thing that is common to all those five things is they all have enabled. In other words, all five okay, can, be, can be enabled, and when they are enabled, they can change their content. So that's the common thread between those five items that we want to analyze, okay? So the next thing we need to do is basically say, for each of these five components, we want to see which one is enabled, okay? So find out which one or ones is or are enabled. So we'll go through that process, okay? You know, because you know, even though we looked, we just looked at the five, we want to find out which ones are enabled in this case. So we'll go through those one by one. This is the register bank. Is it enabled? Is anything going to change in the register bank? Nope. The and is enabled. The document is zero, so that means it's not enabled. We don't have to worry about anything inside the register bank changing in you know, right now. Okay, so we move on to the next item. We look at the flag register, okay? Does it look like that it's going to change? Is it enabled? Hmm? Um, don't worry about the red. <laughs> Since it's not getting enabled, it's not going to store anything anyway, so the red actually does not bother us in this case. Okay, so it's not enabled. And then we move up, move across. Is the RAM component enabled? It is enabled, very good. Okay, because your cell, SEL, or chip select for RAM, is doing the job of enabled. So it is enabled. Okay, so we make a note of that. Okay, so in my notes here, I am making a note and say, RAM is enabled. Okay, and then we go across the screen, you know, scroll down a little bit and then go across. So I'm just going to scroll down a little bit here and then go across the screen again. This is another register, the program counter. Is it enabled? Nope. Okay. And finally, we have the instruction register. Is it enabled? 
Okay, it is enabled. Okay, so we write down here. Okay, I'm just going to write down, I'm going to abbreviate the instruction register as IR. Okay, so IR is also enabled. All right, so now you can start your analysis. So the analysis applies to things that are already enabled. I typically would go, I would prioritize RAM because if, if RAM is enabled, I can ask upfront of questions, okay, which helps me to analyze exactly what is going on you know, with this current step of you know, the process of performing an operation. So I'm going to start with RAM. So I would also write that down and say prioritize RAM in the analysis, okay? So pri Okay, prioritize RAM in the analysis. Okay, so we're looking at the RAM component here. We know it's enabled, so the cell port is done in the search target. So if you know that RAM is enabled, what do you think are the natural next questions to ask? What, what can RAM do? What can we use RAM for? Store and load. Store and load. Very good. So we can either read from RAM or we can write to RAM. Those are the two kinds of operations we can do to RAM. As opposed to ROM, where we can only read from, RAM can also be written to. So, the, so let's try to answer that question. Okay, so if we know that RAM is active, it is enabled, then the next question we need to ask is, are we reading from RAM or are we writing to RAM? So can somebody answer the question? We are reading, okay? So we are reading because, yep, RAM load is a one, that is correct. So because LD RAM load, R-A-M-L-D is a one. Okay, very good, okay. So to understand, to know that when RAM load is a one, you are reading from RAM, that means you have to get familiarized with the components. The next exam, just like the previous one, is um, open book and open notes. But if you rely on having to look it up during the exam, <coughs> it's going to take you extra time, okay? As opposed to somebody else who has already <laughs> memorized this, okay? So I would try to memorize you know, what a zero or one mean to RAM, okay? Okay, we are reading, very good. So what is the next natural question to ask now that we know we are reading from RAM? There are two additional questions to ask and each one has its own sequence of questions to ask you following that, but we'll worry about that later. And you guys can, can ask either one question, there's no priority between those two. So we know we are reading from RAM, what are the next two natural questions to ask? Who hmm? is going to? I like that. Okay. So the next question is who is updating because of the output of RAM? Okay. So I'm going to write it down because you know, these are the steps in order to analyze what is going on in the processor. So the next question is to ask is who is being updated from RAM.D or the data port of RAM? Because the data port of RAM is now acting as an output. So we want to track it down and see who's updating because of that. And in LogiSim, it really helps because you can go to the poking tool and just you know click the wire and now everywhere it goes is highlighted. <coughs> So now we just go ahead and analyze every single point that it connects to and see if it can potential it is potentially useful or important. So the first one we identify is this one over here. It is going to an output pin. But this output pin, the only job of this output pin is so that we can log the output of the processor. So I can do some analysis here automatically later on. So in terms of what the processor is actually doing, is not really useful, okay? So we, we can ignore that point. So we, we cross out this point, it's not particularly useful, and then we're gonna follow it all the way up, and then we follow it all the way across, all the way down, 
and then we look at this and go like, oh, it's going into a multiplexer. So the multiplexer is has multiple input and one single output, and we can see that this is not selecting um, input one anyway. So that means ah, this is a dead end. It it makes no sense to to chase this down to to chase this down any further. Does that make sense? Okay. So now we go back and go like, okay, if that is a dead end, let's see where else it is going. So I think last time we tracked this uh, wire up. So the next one is to track this you know, junction and go all the way up and go to this demultiplexer. Well, a demultiplexer, this is an output, but the demultiplexer is actually turned off right now, which means this is also a dead end. I'm not making use of the content presented by the D port of RAM you know, using this connection. Okay, another dead end. Going back here, now we have the last one, which is going into the D port of the instruction register. Do you think this is of importance? Do you think this connection here is of importance? Yep, because now we know that there's a connection between the D port of RAM and the input, which the input which is also the D port, but this time it's serving as an input to the instruction register. So that means the instruction register is getting some output of the RAM. Is that okay? I'm going to make a note of that, okay? So we'll, I'll just say that the um, instruction register is updated by uh, RAM.D, okay, which is the output of RAM. All right, so what is the next question? We have, we have just you know, chased down one particular question, and what is the next one to ask? Let me go back to the RAM component. And generally speaking, you can go through all the ports and see if there, there are any additional questions to ask. So let's see what we have already answered. Uh, the clear port being a zero, okay, that kind of goes without saying because we don't want to clear the content of RAM. Uh, the low port being a one means we're reading. When you're reading, the clock really does not, is, is not used at all, so we don't have to deal with that. The select port is a one because we are actually using RAM, okay, so we answered that particular question to begin with. And so the only remaining question is the A port. In other words, we know the value of the A port, okay? That's easy to figure out. You just click on the wire, we know the A port is zero, zero right now. But the biggest question is who is specifying that particular value? Where is it coming from? Is that okay? So that's what we're gonna track down, okay? So you can see from the screen right here, okay, it goes, all the way to another output pin called A, okay? But that output pin is useless from the perspective of what the processor is doing because it's just reflecting the value of a wire. It's not actually doing anything about it. But it also goes to the output of this multiplexer. In other words, <clears throat> this multiplexer, the output of this multiplexer is, is basically spe specifying which address of the RAM component we are reading from. So what is the next question that you need to ask? So which input of the multiplexer is connected to the output? So which one do you think it is, is connected? Just by looking at the color of the wires going into the multiplexer, can we determine which input connects to the output? This is a one, right? It's going on to the port that is under gray dot. What is the significance of the port right under the gray dot? <laughs> it's the select, okay? It's the selection uh, of which input. So this bit here, this is a one single bit here because we only have two inputs. So if this is a one, we are connecting input one to the output. If this is dark green or zero, then we are connecting zero, input zero to the output. Okay, so that's what a multiplexer is useful for. It is selecting one of the multiple inputs to connect to the output. And then whatever wire is connected to the gray dot, that is telling us which input to connect to the output. Is that okay? All right. So all this, you know, 
the, the operation of a multiplexer is something that we talked about already in a previous class. So once again, I'm just nagging here. It is important to review all of that material so that you know, by the time we get to this class, we don't have those questions of, oh, what is the gray dot doing with a multiplexer? That is all important stuff. So now we know input one is, uh, is connected to the output. So we continue to go backward and track down what is connected to this input. It connects to um, a PC. Basically, this is just an output pin. We don't care about the output pin. So we go a little bit further here. It is coming out of the program counter. So that is the destination, okay? That's the terminal. So now, at this point, we know that the program counter going through a few hops, okay, is uh, eventually ended up to the A port of RAM. Okay, I'm gonna make a note of that. Okay, so we're I'm making a note that um, the program counter's Q port connects to the A port of RAM, okay? So let me show you my notes up to this point, and then I'll, because I need to, I'm going to make a shorthand or a certain notation that makes it easier to read. You can focus on the left-hand side, and I'll be typing on, uh, you can focus on the right-hand side, I'll be typing on the left-hand side. So what I know at this point can now be summarized by IR, equals to, <clears throat> there are two notations here. You can either use, you can look at RAM as an array. So if you look at RAM as an array, what is the index in this case? In other words, who is determining which element of the array that we are accessing? In other words, who is specifying the A port? Who is specifying the bit pattern of the A port of RAM? Yes, but ultimately, which register is responsible? The program counter, exactly. So this is one way to denote that operation. Okay, so I'm gonna put this in an inline code block like so. But you can also use an alternative notation of IR is the D reference of the program counter. Because RAM is memory. So if I am going to able to fix the memory based on what the program counter has, I could have just said that I'm directing fix the program counter. I'm using the program counter as a pointer to point to a specific location in memory and then use the content of that memory location to update the instruction register. So that, so personally, I prefer the second notation, for the second notation, but if you don't want to look at RAM as a thing, you can always look at RAM as a way, and use the, the D as the index to specify which notation am I using in RAM to update the instruction register. Are we okay so far with this analysis? Because we just figure out, okay, you know, how things are connected. So when we have a rising edge, we know that the uh, instruction register is going to be updated to whatever the program counter is pointing to, which is also zero, zero at this point. So I'm just gonna pause here and see if there are any questions about the process of how we performed this analysis. The result of the analysis is important, but I think the process of the analysis is even more important. Did you say there was nine components that were included? Yeah, I counted nine because you know the instruction register can be counted as four or one. Because you know there are four individual registers in the register bank. So if if the register bank is selected, if it is if it's active then we kind of want to figure out which one of the four registers is getting updated. So from that perspective, it counts as four. But if it's not active, it just goes like, oh, okay, we just take a look at it. It's not active, we just move on. So from that perspective, we can count it as one. So if it's disabled, we count it as one. If it's enabled, we count it as four. Is that okay?
Okay, give me a second. You're talking about the circuit, right? Yep. You mean here? So that's a button. It's a quote-unquote button. That you can click on when you get when you open the focus mode. So when you click this button, it will activate the screen and just say first one is clear out the black box. Which normally you don't even want to do. You don't want to wipe the memory just to try to clear the memory. Yep. All right. Any other questions? All right. So one more thing, okay, so this is something that you can find out on your own, but you can also, I can just tell you too, it's much easier if I were to tell you, because, you know, with almost every single register, uh, the trigger is a rising edge. In other words, if the register is enabled, then it will update its value based on the viewport when the clock is experiencing a zero to one transition. Which is basically what we talked about when we talked about the um, edge sensitive V flip flop. Okay, so this applies to every single register except for one. The only the, the only one register that updates on the falling edge is the microcode pointer. So the microcode pointer has a trigger that is dependent on a falling edge. Okay, so this is kind of important, but it's also pretty easy to remember. Because you know there's only one exception, so I'm I'm gonna write it down anyway, but you don't have to. Okay. So now we are we are going to have a rising edge. So all the registers, the micro code pointer, the program counter, the um yeah, basically all the registers, the flags register, and even the RAM, okay? All of their clocks connect to one single global clock that is on the you know, upper left-hand side of the entire design. So that is the purpose of the clock of a register and also of RAM. It synchronizes the operation. It controls the timing. Um, I know I'm about to update, so when should I update? when the clock goes from zero to one. Because that is when the data presented to the D port is what I want you to remember. Is that okay? So the entire processor is synchronized because there's one single clock. Now that one single clock, you can, how, you can find out where the single clock is by using the poking tool. So all you have to do is to poke any node you know, that connects to the clock, and then you can go to the upper left side it is going to one single clock pin here. The entire system has one single clock. So as it is right now, we know that the rising clock is going to, you know, the rising edge of the clock is going to update the instruction register so that it, up, it is updated based on the output of the RAM, which, is, uh, which has the location pointed to by the program counter. So this is, uh, important because you know, this particular operation, <clears throat> this entire thing, is called the fetch operation or the fetch phase of executing an instruction. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So what do we do after we fetch an instruction from RAM? In other words, all this is doing is not even to do something special. All it is doing is flipping to a particular page of your, of your binder. It's not even reading what is on that page and doing something accordingly. This is just flipping to a page and read the page, but it's not doing anything based on the content of the page yet. All right, so let's go ahead and go back to the simulator, and then we'll have a rising edge. So to cause a rising edge, you can go to simulate, and we only want to tick once. So we, o we want to press Control T exactly once so that the clock goes from zero to one. So Control T right here, it updates. So technically speaking, it is already updated. In other words, 
the instruction register is now containing the content of the case of the notification. Point it to the RAM that is pointed to by the program counter. So why do we see any changes now? Well, because you know, that notation also contains the content of 0, 0. So that's why we don't see any changes, but it is actually already updated at this point. So the next edge is a falling edge. To analyze a falling edge is super easy because only one register is sensitive to a falling edge. All the other registers and also the RAM component, they're all ignoring a falling edge. So we don't have to look at those at all you know, with a falling edge. So with a falling edge, the only thing that can potentially change, well, I should say that will change, is the micro code pointer. So now we want to analyze what's going on you know, when we have a falling edge now. So we'll go ahead and do a little bit of analysis here. I'm just you know, updating my notes here so that you know, it reflects what I just said. Okay. So falling edge updates the microcode pointer. So now the question is, how is the microcode pointer going to be updated? Because we know it's going to be a falling edge. The question is, how is it going to be updated? How do we perform that particular analysis? Let me ask the question again. How is the microcode pointer going to be updated when we have the following? So we know the timing is when the clock goes from one to zero, but the question is, how is it going to be updated? In other words, what is going to be the new value of the microcode? How do we analyze that? Hmm? Here's your answer. But how do you know? So the analysis starts with the D port of the microcode pointer, right? Because the D port is to input to a register. So we start with the D port of the register that is enabled and it is about to be up. Is that okay? So we follow that and go like, huh, okay, we're going to multiply the right away. So what do we do when we say, oh, the output of the multiplexer is updating the microcode pointer. So what do we do now? What kind of uh, reasoning do we perform? What is the next question to ask? What is the job of a multiplexer? So this is why it is important to understand how each component in the processor works, because otherwise there's no way someone can answer that question. Is what do we ask? What question do we ask next? Because unless you know what a multiplexer is doing, you won't be able to tell what question to ask. So a multiplexer selects one of the inputs in order to connect to the output, and we know the output of the multiplexer is going to update the microcode pointer. So what is the next question to ask? The multiplexer getting information. Which input? connects to the output, okay? That is correct, okay? So which input is selected to connect to the output? And how do we know that? So when you look at the multiplexer here, it has got one, two, three, four. There are four ports. Which port will tell me which of the input ports connect to the output? The gray one, very good, okay. So the gray dot says, okay, it is a bright green, so what does that tell us? Is it input zero or input one that connects to the output? It's input one, very good, excellent. So now we go to input one, oh, excuse me, yeah, input one of the multiplexer, and then we go like, where is it coming from? So we drag down the road, goes all the way around, and then it's coming out of the path, okay, it doesn't matter. So the question is, what are we adding? We are adding the value of the microcode pointer to one to become the output. In other words, the output of the adder is simply the current value of the micro point, micro code, sorry, microcode pointer plus one. Is that okay? So you were correct that we are just you know, updating the microcode pointer to zero, zero, 001, but this is why it is updated to zero, zero, 001. Okay. Okay, cool.
So now we are ready to have a control T again for the following X. So now this time you will see the micro code pointer changing from 0, 0, 0 to 0, 0, 1. Control T, done, okay? So the next clock edge is going to be a rising edge again because the clock is currently a zero. So that means the next transition is going to turn it into a one. So now we have to go back to the original thing that we did, right? We'll look at all the five things and see which one is enabled. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. <clears throat> so I'm going to use exactly the same process systematically. So this way, you know, it is easy to kind of remember how to do it. Uh, the register bank does not have anything enabled, so I'm not too concerned about it. Um, RAM is actually not enabled either. Okay, it is not selected. So flex register is also not enabled. It's not updating at all. So now we scroll back, and we see that, the oh, the program counter is enabled. And then the instruction register is not enabled. Okay, so the program counter is updating. Okay, it's going to be updated when we have another edge for the clock. So what is the next question to ask? Now that we know the program counter is going to be updated based on what is presented to the speed clock, what is the next question? Where is it coming from? Yes, exactly. Okay, so now we try to track down where the input is coming from. We go like, oh, okay, another motor flexor. So now we look at this multiplexer, and then we ask, um, okay, so what is the, um, which input of the multiplexer is connected to the output, and why, okay? So we want to ask that why too. In this case, it is the PC MUX, that is a dark green, which is a zero, which means you know, we are now selecting input zero to connect to the output for this multiplexer. So I'm going to split the question. There are two questions to ask here. The first question is, where is input zero coming from? Okay, it's going through basically the same mechanism of adding one to the current value of the program counter. In other words, we're incrementing the program counter. That's an easy one, because we just did the same analysis with the micro code pointer. The more difficult question is, why are we selecting input zero? Well, it is a more difficult question because PC MUX is not coming from the ROM itself. It is actually, you know, the result of um, a multiplexer. So that portion is located to the slightly to the upper right hand side. So this is PC MUX. The question is, why is it a zero? So now you have to track it back into the multiplexer here. So this multiplexer is a little bit, you know, kind of funky because it has got. It, it has eight inputs, okay? So it has eight inputs, and we are changing one of the inputs to the output. So, and this time, what should we look at next? My question is, why is PC MUX a zero? So what is the next question to ask in order to answer that question? <clears throat> this is a multiplexer. It has multiple inputs, and somehow the output is a zero. And you cannot single out which one is the input just by looking at the input versus the output because there are seven inputs that are all zeros that can contribute to zero of PC box. What do you what what kind of question do you ask next? The selector. Very good. Okay. So we are now tracking down the selector, which is the gray dot. And the selector says five or one zero one. Okay, so that means input five, input zero, one, two, three, four, five. This is input five. This input is connected to the output. This input connects to a constant of zero, and that's why PC box is a zero. Very good. So that's that's the explanation of why PC box is a zero. So now the question is, so do we also have to explain what is why PC MUX, MUX is a 5? The answer is no, because PC MUX MUX connects to microcode data, and the microcode data eventually connects to the D port of ROM. So that means that concludes our explanation. That's all we need to know is, oh, the ROM said so.
Okay, because the ROM or the content of the ROM is specified by me. Okay, you know, and this is basically what I want the processor to do for this particular phase or for this particular step. So the explanation stops with, oh, that's what the ROM tells us to do. Is that okay? All right. So the net effect of this entire operation, when I have a rising edge, you know, of the clock, is very simple. The program counter goes from zero zero to zero one. We are simply incrementing the program counter. Okay. So I'm going to jot down this note here. Okay. So the next operation is PC plus plus. Okay. And I'll show my note to you too. Okay, so I basically just use a notation, a C notation, to basically say the program counter now gets incremented. Okay, but why are we incrementing the program counter? The reason why we are incrementing the program counter is because the clock code that it was running to, which is at location 00, zero is already read and it is now being stored as instruction register. So that means, oh, we can move on to the next one. Okay, you know, that location is already read into the instruction register. Okay, so that's why we're incrementing the program counter to get ready for the next opcode. So let's go ahead and do a control T, you know, just to make sure that the program counter is going to increment on the rising edge. So control T, it is now zero one. Okay, just as expected, very good. So now we have a falling edge again, which means the only thing we need to look at is the microcode pointer, because nobody else of the entire processor is sensitive to a falling edge. The microcode pointer is the only thing that is sensitive to a falling edge. So now we go to the microcode pointer. Is it enabled? Yes, because it is the enable of the microcode pointer is co is connected to a constant of one. So that's why it is always enabled. So you don't have to really ask the question. So the next question is something that we asked earlier already. Okay, so how is the microcode pointer going to update in this case? Uh, we're going to have to track down what connects to the D port because it has to input into a register to update it. It's coming from a multiplexer, but this time you can see the multiplexer, uh, the select of the multiplexer is a dark green. Go like, oh, so that means we are not going to use input one like last time. We're going to use input zero this time. So let me explain something that I forgot to explain earlier, which is why is it dark green? You know, where is this dark green coming from? Okay, it's actually pretty easy to answer because this one goes straight to one of the bits coming out of the out of the ROM. So that means, oh, okay, the explanation simply is the ROM says so. Okay. Okay, not too big of a deal. But when you look at input zero, it goes like, okay, so what is this? So now I'm going to scroll just a little bit to show enough parts here. So when we try to analyze why, uh, why zero, zero, zero and not zero, zero is presented to the micro code pointer, we kind of have to go like, okay, where is that coming from? Let's see. This wire goes to a splitter, which is acting more like a merger, okay? So what is the splitter trying to say? Let me magnify this, because this way you guys can you can actually see the tiny little number. Let me magnify, I think that should be in now. Okay, let me go back to where we were before. There we go, okay. So what does this say? This is a constant of zero, it is contributing to bit zero to bit three of the input to ultimately the micro code. In other words, we know that bit zero to bit three of the new micro code pointer value is going to be zero, 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 zero to the final. Is that okay? Okay. So, like, what about the rest? Because you know, the micro code pointer is a, has a 12 bit. Um, it's a 12-bit register, so we just accounted for the least significant four bits. What about the other eight bits? We look at the splitter. The splitter says bit four to bit eleven of whatever goes into the multiplexer, which ends up as a micro code pointer, is coming from a terminal called this one. 
the instruction. Next question is, where is the instruction? I'm going to zoom out again, okay, because you know, th th there's no need to zoom out that far. So the instruction is right here. And it's a tunnel. So now we are basically going asking where is, who is connected to instruction as a node. That's the output of the instruction register. In other words, the byte that we read earlier from Ben is now being used to specify which port is the letters of the new value of the micro node. Okay, so far, right? So let me see how what we can do to document this, okay? Because there are, there are different ways to do this and they're all kind of equivalent, but they may be new to some of you because of the uh, the use of bitwise operators. So the next operation, this operation that we are doing right now is the microcode pointer, microcode pointer is getting, um, there are several ways to do this, but um, we know it's related to IR, the instruction register. Well, one way to specify this is we are left shifting the instruction register by four bits. So less than less than, um, not used in the context of C out, specifies bitwise shift. In other words, we basically shift four zeros from the right hand side into the bit pattern of the instruction register. And then the result, which is 12 bit wide, is going to be stored in the micro code. That's one way to look at it. The other way to look at it, okay, which is to some people it might be more intuitive, but to me it is actually less intuitive. So the other way to look at this is the microcode pointer is updated to IR times 16, okay, multiplication by 16. It ends up to the, ends up being the same thing, okay, because you know every time we shift a zero in from the right hand side, we are doubling the value of whatever bit pattern is on the other side. So if we shift four zeros in, then it is the same thing as multiplication by 16. So either way works, okay? But that's how I throw this on. Are we good so far? Okay. So this particular operation also has its specific name. This is what we call the decode. This is the decode phase of executing an instruction. So the first phase is called fetch. The second phase is called decode. So this is where the decode happens. I'm going to make this more, make it stand out a little bit more, okay, just so that you, know, you we can see it. So we have fetch, and then we have decode. There we go. Okay. So are there any questions at this point about you know, you know, what fetch is doing versus what decode is doing? Fetch is going to memory, take the byte that is pointed to by the program counter, and then store that in the instruction register. Decode is to take the bit pattern in the instruction register, and then shift it by four bits, and then store that into the microcode. Is that okay? Right? Now what do we do? We just give it a falling edge and see what happens, okay? So what do you think is going to happen? What do you think is being presented to the input of the microcode pointer at this point? The instruction register has a value of 0, 0. So what happens when you multiply 0, 0 by 16? You get 0, 0, 0, okay? One additional 0. So that's what's going to happen, okay? So if I do a control T, which gives it the, the falling edge, you can see that the microcode pointer is now back to zero. Then you guys go like, oh, this is an infinite loop. We're gonna keep doing this forever because this is exactly how we started the whole class, you know, when we started the class at about approximately 1030. Well, yes and no, okay? Not exactly the same. Because even though everything else is the same, I haven't really updated RAM, none of the four registers from A to D has updated, the flag register has not updated, we did change one register other than the microcode pointer. Which one is it? 
you can barely see it right here, like the bottom half of that register. Which the register? Counter. The program counter, exactly. So the program counter is no longer at zero, zero. It is now at zero, one. So that means what's going to happen next is the next, when we do a control T again, it is going to take location one, the content of location one of RAM, which also is zero, zero, because we never put anything useful in the RAM in this class, right? But it's grabbing a different zero, zero. Stash it into the instruction register for the fetch, and then it will take that zero, zero, multiply by 16, and then put that 12 bit zero, zero, zero in hexadecimal back into the micro four pointer. But in between those two steps, we also increment the program counter. So that means if I were to just do a zero, zero, a whole bunch of control T, the only thing that's going to change is the program counter. It will keep counting up, and then we grab each of those zero, zero, put it into the instruction register, also increment the program counter, and then change the instruction register, excuse me, the micro code pointer back to zero, 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 and repeat the whole process. Is it a really useful program? No. But does it illustrate the steps in order to grab a byte from RAM and then interpret, go to the location that interprets what we are supposed to do? The answer is yes. Okay. So we have addressed two of the phases of executing an instruction, fetch and decode. Okay. The one thing that we have not explained is execute because this is zero, zero, by the way, is also called no op in this particular architecture, which means it, it's not doing a single thing, okay? It moves the program counter along, but otherwise it has no effect whatsoever. It did not do any computation. It did, it did not do any branching. It did not do anything useful at all, okay? So that's, I think, what we can call that the end of today's lecture. So there are a few important things you know, from today's lecture. One, I think the most important part is how do we analyze the processor? Which ones are the most important components of the processor to start your analysis? Because if you start your analysis by following every bit out of the ROM, it's gonna take you forever to figure out what the processor is doing, okay? In other words, if we track down every single bit coming out of the new port of ROM from 0 to 25, it's going to take you a while. But if you use the trick that I just described, look at the register bank as one thing, look at the flex register as one thing, the program counter as one thing, um, the instruction register as one thing, and the RAM as one thing, there are only five things that you need to look at. Whichever one is enabled or selected, make note of that. Okay. So there are times when one or two of them you know, may be enabled, so track those things. Once you know which ones are enabled, then you start to ask questions. I would start with RAM, because if RAM is selected, you can naturally ask a whole bunch of questions automatically. Is it reading or writing? Who is specifying the address? And who is reading or specifying the content to write to RAM? So those are all the follow-up questions. And by answering the follow-up questions, you, know, you can figure out, oh, okay, so this is what we are actually doing. Are we doing okay so far with this part of the discussion? So I would call today's lecture, you know, I would call it super important because this actually tells you, tells you the process of how we try to figure out what the processor is going to do. That okay? All right. So I got everything recorded. I will upload my own notes, okay, which is incomplete. I tried to write as much as I could, but it's not easy to be teaching the class and try to capture the notes at the same time, okay? Um, oh, one more thing. You know, this is not related to assembly language programming, but nonetheless, it is related to your endeavor of, you know, finishing up your degree here and then you know, transferring later on is you might want to talk to some other students in the class and compare notes. When I said compare notes, I meant it literally, okay? You know, talk to another student, okay, pick someone else, okay? And then say, okay, what, what notes did you take today? 
And by comparing your notes with somebody else's notes, you might say, huh, okay, I didn't write that down. Why did you write it down? Okay, why do you think that one is, that part is important? Because note taking is probably one of the most important factor, you know, um, influencing your success in a class. Um, simply because our memory is limited. Now, when I'm talking about this, when I'm explaining this, all this stuff along, you, know, you, you might be saying, oh, but I'm following along just fine. I'm understanding everything. But then later on, if I ask you to reproduce the same step, you go like, I cannot remember anything. So the, your notes is what is enabling you to recreate the scenario that we talk about in class so that when you need to study, when you, go, when you want to go through the whole process, you can reestablish the entire context without having to watch the entire video all over again. So it saves you time. And also in the process of writing down, in, in the process of formulating the words that you want to write down in your notes, you're making neural pathways in, in, in your brain. Okay. In other words, that's the first step of studying for this class. It is during the lecture as you write down the notes. That is the first step of quote unquote studying for the class. But your notes, because I give you open book and open notes as an option for all the exams, so you are actually in the process creating your own study guide for the next exam. So that's why you know writing notes in this class is so important because it serves multiple purposes. All right. So everything is still recorded, okay? Which means sometimes you know if you want to go like, okay, this is kind of important, and I'm kind of losing track of what Tech is talking about jot down the time and the date. So that way you can go back to that particular video and then you can replay the video and pause a whole bunch of times and then think about, okay, what did he mean when he said blah, 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 okay? So that gives you the opportunity to revisit a particular part of the lecture without having to rewind everything from the beginning and watch the whole thing all over again. You just go straight to that one single time point and you go like, okay, this is where I need to revisit. All right, so I'm going to stop yapping and give you the assignment for, for the lab that you need to do today. So let me just switch back to the browser. And I have no idea where it's at here. So I'm going to have to look for it. Uh, this is 12220 of the section. There we go. Mm -hmm. I think I've lost the link to, oh, this one, there we go. So today's lab is called More Processor Components because we already talked about a few last time. It is now published, which means you have access to it. The access code is TTP or all lowercase. It stands for Tax Toy Processor. Because what we saw earlier was basically a toy processor. The only reason why it is designed is to illustrate you know, how a processor works. At least you know, one simple processor in this case. <clears throat> so you should be able to get into the lab right now. So I just need to get a confirmation and then I'll go get some water to drink. Yep, go ahead. No such thing as an entrance versus an exit. They're basically all logical things. That's the bottom line of a note. So if you have a wire that ends up in the tunnel, and then another wire that ends up in the tunnel, and another tunnel of the same name, those two wires are basically one. Or nobody specifies anything at all. That's also possible. We can end up with a note that nobody has put anything and not, nobody is reading anything. But you are correct. Only up to one connection point should be specifying the content when it goes out to the other. So it should be a specified amount of time. 
um, up to one. <laughs> Because because no because it, you can end up in a scenario where nobody is actually specifying the content of a node, but when somebody is specifying, it is up to one instead of multiple because otherwise they end up with a bug spike. Yep, you are correct. All right, so I am going to stop the recorder and upload.